Good afternoon. Welcome. You are tuned into the Labor Forum here on WRFG 89.3 FM in Atlanta. Uh, my name is Diane Mathewitz and I'm a retired auto worker and co-host of this program. I want to make sure that we uh, say hello to our other co-host. Hi, Paul. Hi, Diane. Paul is a retired um, ATU, uh, worked with MARTA. And hi, Tamika. Hi, Diane. And Tamika is the uh, executive director of the Atlanta chapter of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. So those are the three co-hosts and uh, we are getting ready to start our program. I want to remind everybody that there's multiple ways you can listen to WRFG and in particular that you can listen to the Labor Forum um, besides having it tuned into your radio at 89.3 FM. You can listen on your computer any place you can go on to the App Store and get the WRFG app, and you'll also be able to listen on your mobile device. And for those of you who choose to, you can watch us live on the Labor Forum YouTube channel. And if you're not able to do that, uh, the program is archived on that uh, YouTube channel, and you can watch us live a different time. <laughs> so those are all the ways that we have uh, tried to make it possible for you to be able to hear the guests and the information and the analysis that we provide here on the Labor Forum. The opinions that are expressed on this program uh, may not necessarily be those of the Board of Directors, staff, or volunteers here at WRFG. We're going to get right into our format. We'll start off with the labor headlines and we'll move into this week in labor history. Then we'll have uh, our activism calendar and then we're going to have our guest uh, who is Dr. Francis Johnson, uh, state president of the NAACP. We're looking for him to walk in the door any moment. So let's start with labor headlines. The struggle for a higher, meaning livable, minimum wage is an international one. Globalization by the capitalist economic system has driven wages lower around the world, increasing poverty and repression in many of the formerly colonized countries as well as in the industrial nations. A case in point is Indonesia, a vast island nation of about 250 million people with lots of industry and natural resources. This past month, Indonesian unions mounted a national campaign to raise the minimum wage. Millions of workers took to the streets in Jakarta and other cities and towns, causing many factories and businesses to come to a standstill. It must be noted that in 1965-1966, a bloody military coup backed by the U.S. overthrew the government of President Sukarno, killing a million Indonesians, many of whom were members of the Indonesian Communist Party, trade unionists, and other progressive community activists. Under military rule, political activity, including worker organizing, was suppressed. Yet, last month's national actions by workers are evidence that the struggle for human rights will always rise again. As a result of the campaign, some regions of Indonesia raised the minimum wage substantially, while other areas did not. The struggle continues there. There are two victories to report in the United States. First, port truck drivers who have struck the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, California, five times, including this past summer, and for those of you who listen to the Labor Forum religiously, you know that we reported on those strikes. They have reached an agreement with a major trucking company to be reclassified as employees rather than independent contractors. As of January 1st this year, Shippers Transport Express will move to, and they, this is what they call it, an employee-based business model. The drivers voted to join the Teamsters Union and will enter into negotiations with the company for a contract on wages, benefits, and working conditions. The group Justice for Port Drivers reports that similar talks are taking place with other companies with more victories to come soon, ending the practice of misclassifying port truck drivers as independent contractors. And as the, uh, those of you who listen to the interviews that we've held with the port drivers in Savannah know, that means that they are eligible for, they are not eligible for unemployment, for workers' comp, they have no benefits, 
Many, many, many of them are forced to uh, exist with food stamps and other social service uh, um, um, benefits because they make so little money despite working 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And from Florida comes the news that on January 8th, the Fresh Market grocery store chain joined the fair food program initiated by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers thus becoming the 13th large buyer of tomatoes to only purchase produce from growers whose workers receive higher wages and have rights to safe working conditions. Consumers can now look for the fair food label on tomatoes in Whole Foods stores and others. The label depicts a proud female farm worker holding a bucket of produce picked under the protections of the fair food program. The label says, consumer-powered, worker-certified. Publix remains one of the largest supermarket chains to refuse to join the program. Members of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers have come to Atlanta often to demonstrate in front of public stores, urging customers to tell Publix to respect farm workers' human rights. The CIW credits its success in improving the conditions of this mostly immigrant workforce first to the workers' courage, creativity, and determination, but also to the support of consumers, faith and labor allies, for pressuring corporations to join the Fair Food Program. With another grocery chain on board, public's refusal is increasingly shameful. And those are our labor headlines for today, and then we're going to move right into Paul's This Week in Labor History. Thanks, Diane. Uh, three important events in labor history this week. The first is the strike of mostly immigrant textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts that began on January 11, 1912. It became known as a fight not only for bread but for roses too. After an eight-week struggle, the strikers won a 15 percent pay increase and other demands. The impact of this strike led to pay increases for over 150,000 New England textile workers. Lawrence was a city of immigrants from 51 different nationalities. These immigrants worked in Lawrence's mills, and because of their different ethnic backgrounds, mill owners believed that the workers would not be able to organize because of their differences. The owners proved to be wrong. During the first week, 14,000 workers walked off the job in Lawrence and were followed by 9,000 more in the coming weeks. The Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, took a major role in leading the strike. They successfully organized the different ethnic groups who lived and worked together and raised the money necessary to feed and provide for the strikers and their families. Many children were sent away to other cities in order to maintain the resources for the striking workers. This move gained tremendous sympathy from the public and therefore the factory owners attempted to make sure this practice was stopped immediately. On February 24, 1912, they sent police officers to prevent some mothers and children from leaving Lawrence on a train to Philadelphia. The officers beat up the women and children and caused a public relations nightmare that led to a congressional investigation of the strike. The owners realized that they had been beaten and finally came to terms. The true heroes of this strike were the women of the city of Lawrence. Women's neighborhood associations were focused more on women than ethnic identity and thus became more inclusive and unified. Women also were prolific forces on the picket lines. They were better than the men at finding scabs who were attempting to cross picket lines and were often more militant than their male counterparts. Three years later, on January 17, 1915, Lucy Aldean Gonzalez Parsons led a hunger march in Chicago. She was born around 1853 in Texas, probably as a slave, to parents of Native American, African American, and Mexican ancestry. In 1871, she married Albert Parsons, a former Confederate soldier. They were forced to flee north from Texas to Chicago due to racist reactions to their interracial marriage. Described by the Chicago Police Department in the 1920s as more dangerous than a thousand rioters, Parsons and her husband had become highly effective anarchist organizers primarily involved in the labor movement in the late 19th century, 
but also participating in revolutionary activism on behalf of pe pol political prisoners, people of color, the homeless, and women. In 1886, her husband, who had been heavily involved in campaigning for the eight-hour day, was arrested, tried, and executed on November 11, 1887, by the state of Illinois on charges that he had conspired in the Haymarket Riot, an event which was widely regarded as a political frame-up and what, which marked the beginning of May Day labor rallies and protest. After her husband's death, Lucy Parsons continued to remain active in the labor movement, women's issues, and organizing against hunger and unemployment. This work led to the successful hunger march in Chicago on January 17, 1915. What is also important about this event is that IWW writer Ralph Chaplin wrote the famous labor song, Solidarity Forever, for the march. He began writing Solidarity Forever in 1914 while he was covering the Kanawha coal miners' strike in Huntington, West Virginia. Chaplin was a dedicated member of the Industrial Workers of the World, a writer at the time for Solidarity, the official IWW publication in the eastern United States and a cartoonist for the organization. Solidarity Forever includes a verse that is often not sung. Is there aught we hold in common with the greedy parasite who would lash us into serfdom and would crush us with his might? Is there anything left to us but to organize and fight? For the union makes us strong. Finally, the third event this week is the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. on January 15, 1929. We will be speaking more about his life next Monday, but want to end with this quote. Dr. King once said, We look around every day and we see thousands and millions of people making inadequate wages. Not only do they do the work in our hospitals, they work in our hotels, they work in our laundries, they work in domestic service they find themselves unemployed. You see, no labor is really menial unless you're not getting adequate wages. Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis on April 4, 1968, while supporting African-American sanitation employees who were members of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 1733. They were on strike for higher wages, better working conditions, and dignity. Thank you, Paul. And so uh, just before we go into Tamika's uh, calendar of uh, events that are coming up, we're going to play a few bars of both of those songs. So Christopher, are we ready first for Bread and Roses? So uh, for those of you that haven't heard this song before, I believe this uh, version is sung by Judy Collins. Solidarity Forever. We're not here in Solidarity Forever. We'll see if we can get it uh, up on and we'll play it uh, later in the end of the program. I know that's a, a song that every uh, worker and most activists know, but we'll uh, see if we can actually get a version of it. So we'll move on to Tamika Atkins now with uh, some upcoming events important for all of the listeners of the Labor Forum and WRFG. Uh, thanks, Diane. So tomorrow, uh, January 13th, uh, there is a planned state execution of Andrew Brannon, a Vietnam veteran suffering from PTSD. Uh, the organization Open Door has organized an action to oppose the execution at the state capitol tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. January 15th is the National Day of Action Against Police Violence. Uh, and Gen Y, uh, a local organization in Atlanta, is launching their hashtag CAMSONCOPSPROTOCOL campaign. 
Um, they are organizing a community rally at Georgia State University Plaza uh, January 15th at 12 p.m. and an evening panel discussion from 5 to 9 p.m. at the American Friends Service Committee Building at 60 Walton Street Southeast. The Atlanta North Georgia Labor Council is hosting their 2015 Martin Luther King Human Rights Prayer Breakfast this Friday, January 16th at 8 a.m. It's at the Weston Peachtree Plaza at 210 Peachtree Street Plaza, Atlanta, Georgia, 30310. Thanks, Tamika. Well, we'll uh, go right into our guest who has uh, come into the studio, just fresh from a demonstration and at the conference. Um, we're going to have to figure out how to move this mic here so that Francis is also able to get in and you'll have to scooch up a little bit. So uh, both those who are watching, this is uh, Reverend Francis Johnson, and those of you who are listening, this is Reverend Francis Johnson. <laughs> he is the president of the state uh, NAACP here in Georgia, uh, also a lawyer, a dad of young kids, an uh, activist in this community, and uh, a leading member of Moral Monday Georgia. Welcome to the Labor Forum here at WRFG. Thank you for having me, Diane. I'm looking forward to sharing with your listeners. Okay, so um, for those of you who listen to WRFG, you've been hearing the promo, uh, the PSA. Uh, that let you know that there was an event here in Atlanta uh, that um, uh, marked the opening of the 2015 Georgia Assembly and also the swearing in of uh, Nathan Deal for his second term as governor. So would you mind telling us what happened today? Well, the people of Georgia rose up, uh, diverse uh, and uh, many, and made sure that those who gathered for pomp and circumstance and ceremony and a return to business as usual under the Golden Dome uh, did not go unchallenged. Uh, there was protest, there was song, there was demonstration, and there was a die-in in the Capitol uh, in advance of our efforts to expand Medicaid, to address the needful necessary reforms in criminal justice, and to talk about a state that will not put education first and foremost as a priority. And so uh, the protest uh, lasted uh, for some time and then we even gathered on the steps afterwards and, 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 uh, and sang freedom songs and continued uh, over at the church. It was a great day uh, for progressive movement here in Georgia as not only the Atlanta group of Moral Monday but there was a group from Columbus, a group from Athens, from Statesboro, from Hinesville, all here to say that Moral Monday is back, bigger, stronger, and bolder. So let's maybe, uh, there could possibly be some folks who have never heard of Moral Monday. Um, maybe we should start a little bit about how this, uh, the inspiration came from North Carolina and really what uh, Moral Monday Georgia accomplished during last year, which was its first time on the scene here in Georgia. Right. Thank you, Diane. Uh, the Reverend William Barber, who leads the North Carolina NAACP, along with a coalition of nearly 80 organizations uh, working over several years, uh, arrived to a place where they believed that the movement was bigger than any one particular organization. And so they adopted this framework of North Carolina Forward Together. And from that framework uh, sprang uh, Moral Monday a really a language that calls for a new dialogue in the public square around ideals of morality uh, that are not based on the stale uh, rhetoric of the so-called Christian right but upon the common values that we all share uh, that, that have guided uh, progressive movements uh, throughout the ages. The fact that uh, every human being deserves security for their body. Uh, education for their mind, uh, food uh, for their, uh, their hunger, and uh, a sense of being able to contribute to the search for the common good, the right to vote and participate in the public square. These are shared values. They're bigger than any one group. They're bigger than the NAACP and the American Friends Service Committee and the Sierra Club and other groups who are conveners of this effort. 
uh, we, we put aside our own individual insignias and join hands and join efforts uh, because at the root of all of our isms that we're fighting against, sexism, racism, homophobism, xenophobia, all of these isms is a social construct that's rooted in the law, economic benefits that confer to a few uh, at the disadvantage of the many, uh, political expediency that allow politicians to get reelected over and over despite uh, uh, going against the will uh, and the, the interest of the people, and there's a, so, there's a social maintenance that allows all of this to take place. If we're going to cut down any of these isms, we will cut them down together. And so that's what Moral Monday attempts to do, draw us together in one convening space to advance our mutual interest. So, okay, so last year Moral Monday sort of, uh, you know, made a splash at the state capitol because it went beyond the rallies that happen year after year after year. Right. Whether it's teachers or healthcare workers or, um, you know, just so many different groups come to the capitol. Uh, they come to lobby, they come, they hold a rally out on the steps. But Moral Monday Georgia last year took a different kind of posture. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. We organized ourselves around uh, five, I call them game changers or priorities. They dealt with education, that, it should, that, that all Georgians deserve high quality, free public education that's pre-K pre through post-secondary option that's accessible and affordable prepares our learners for a world class, with a world class education for global opportunities. Fair criminal justice system with diversity on the bench and at the bar. Uh, uh, health and wellness, particularly I push for expansion of Medicaid. Uh, promotion of a, a green environment uh, where we are stewards and trustees of this place. Uh, and, and then a, a, you know, a commitment, a deep commitment the civic engagement, the right to vote, unfettered access to the ballot, and the, these were these were things that we can agree on as or, as organizations, and we committed to show up and keep showing up uh, week after week, uh, and we advanced the cause by uh, letting them know that we were willing to put our bodies on the line, and as a result, 72 brave Georgians went to jail last year, and uh, we hadn't had that kind of activism in a long time uh, in one space. Uh, and and you know we we showed up with hundreds last year. This year we're showing up with thousands, and we won't stop until uh, there's a real redress of the lack of moral morality in our public policy. Uh, so I was uh, there today for at least a good part of uh, today's event, and, and so we should say that how it opened up really was with a convening of uh, several hundred people who crowded into Central Presbyterians. A fellowship hall right, right across from the Capitol. And we had, um, one of the things that's happening today is after Governor Deal is sworn in, he is going to deliver something called the State of the State Address. That's right. And uh, we decided, uh, as uh, the people, that we should have an opportunity to actually address what this, our state is, that's what, right. what condition we're in. And so we had two speakers, and Reverend Johnson was one, and the other was Al Lucier, who's uh, the founder of It's Bigger Than You. Do you want to sort of reprise a little bit of what you said this morning? Well, I, mean, I just say that the Governor Deal's marketing team uh, did a good job on, uh, on whitewashing the facts, if you will, uh, in the November election cycle. And of course, they've worked overtime at painting a version of Georgia, which I know many of your listeners uh, uh, know is foreign to the reality that they face. The governor says that uh, these are the best days that Georgia has ever seen. But the fact of the matter is we are last in unemployment. The fact of the matter is our, our education system lags far behind 46 other states. Uh, we are depriving our citizens of uh, health care they've already paid for, uh, that uh, people in Ohio, uh, New Jersey, and even Arizona with their crazy-ass governor, Jan Brewer, she had enough sense to accept what their citizens had already paid for in terms of the expansion of Medicaid. And so we believe that Governor Deal uh, has a narrow view of what Georgia, what real Georgians are facing. You know, you, we talk, this is the labor form. And, and, and there's a bill that's already been pre-filed that actually attempts to uh, further bind local governments from being able to adjust the minimum wage in their localities. 
So instead of addressing a livable wage and putting that on the legislative agenda, they're further binding communities that want to uh, increase the minimum wage and, and talk about and promote a living wage in their communities from even being able to do so. This is the kind of backward policies that this governor and this legislature are driving and it, instead of moving Georgia forward, it's taking Georgia back. And so we've got to address that. And that's what the state of the state, state of the people's address was really about. Uh, letting the facts be known uh, and setting the stage for our agenda for Moral Monday. And then committing to that agenda, regardless of whether that results in jail uh, or whether that results in reprisals from the government, which some of our members have already experienced. Uh, we're committed and uh, we're going forward. We're not going to take a step back. Uh, Reverend Johnson, um, I had a question about, in keeping with uh, the observance of Dr. King's birthday sure. and the fact that it's this week, how you see Moral Monday as a progression uh, from, the, from the Civil Rights Movement. Absolutely. You know, many people will uh, lift uh, Dr. King's image and call his name and, uh, and pay lip service to his ideals. Uh, but their heart is far from it. And, uh, and that starts with the leader of this state, Governor Deal, and from uh, members of both parties uh, who would not be in step with Dr. King uh, if he was with us today. Um, as a matter of fact, you, this is the labor forum, and, and labor issues are, are, are very important. In 1968, the year King was assassinated, the minimum wage was $1.25. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it would be well over $15 today. Uh, the president uh, talks about uh, a, a minimum wage of $10.10. That's still behind just cost of inflation. So to do lip service to King's message, and remember he died fighting for a living wage, a fair wage for sanitation workers. King would be with us in Moral Monday. He would not have attended the governor's coronation, excuse me, inauguration today, uh, and he would certainly be on our side in this fight. Thank you so much for that, and we'll be right back. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be back with uh, Reverend Francis Johnson and the Labor Forum team right after these couple of messages. We're back, and you just heard uh, the announcement that uh, WRFG was playing for the last many days to uh, give you that information about the event that we now are talking about that has happened today. And that was the opening of the Georgia General Assembly and the inauguration of Governor Deal. But more importantly, it was the launch of the 2015 Moral Monday Georgia campaign for progressive legislation here in the state. In the studio, we have with us Reverend Francis Johnson, who is the state president of the NAACP here in Georgia and a leader of Moral Monday, Georgia. And um, we were discussing some of the legislation that is likely to come before these legislators uh, over the next couple of months. I think Tamika has a question that she wanted to follow up with. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask you to expand. You talked about under Governor Deal's leadership um, that there uh, is motion happening to make um, any uh, city or local government that wants to increase their minimum wage, making that process further binding. Um, so you, that's very specific language. Can you just expand on that a little bit more? Well, of course, the Governor Deal uh, and his party talk a lot about uh, 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 local government and supporting local government. But when the city of Atlanta attempted to raise its minimum wage, they were opposed to it. And they're producing legislation to bind the hands of local government from being able to raise the minimum wage for their citizenry. And, and that's just not fair and it's not right, but it's, it is typical of this administration that puts the interest of corporations and the few above the interest of the people. And there are other pieces of legislation which give us serious concern. Uh, for example, uh, we can expect several bills on, on, uh, on dealing with voting rights. We can expect uh, bills to bind and stop government from being able to hold Sunday elections. Uh, Sunday voting? We, Sunday voting, that's right, Sunday voting. Uh, to roll back early voting, there was an attempt last legislative session to roll it back from 21 to 6 days, and more Monday was a big part of stopping that. 
in its tracks. We expect that bill to be reintroduced. Additionally, they're going to make third party registration more difficult. So for organizations like the League of Women Voters, the NAACP and others who who really work hard at registering folks, it'll make that difficult for us to do uh, the work that we do. Uh, and, and so we can expect those sorts of bills. Then there's going to be an onslaught of bills uh, that chip away at uh, the, ki the kind of uh, fair tax policies which we have fought hard over the years to achieve and make it make it harder for working Georgians to get ahead and and there's something not right when the representatives of the people uh, convene themselves in the people's house and instead of handling the people's business uh, work for the privileged few. few. Moral Monday raises its voice, raises its protest and will be there to challenge that every step of the way. I had a, a follow-up question, and I guess it's sure. uh, the flip side. Are there any good bills that uh, our listeners should know about? Because one of the things that's important is when a legislator, um, you know, a fair, decent legislator, actually produces some piece of legislation that would help us, uh, the majority of the people. Uh, we need to know about them Absolutely. so that we can not only be down there to oppose the bad bills, but be down there to really uh, give voice that we want certain legislation passed. So what is, what is possible that could actually improve the situation here for workers in Georgia? Absolutely. I'm grateful that you asked that question because our strategy is not just defensive, it's offensive as well. We have to advance the interest uh, through policy and of course um, there's several bills that do that. House Bill 8, I want to highlight that bill. It would raise the minimum wage to above $15 an hour, sponsored by Representative Tyrone Brooks in the House. It will be sponsored by Senator Vincent Ford in the Senate. We're grateful for that piece of legislation because it's a, it's a, it's a point to begin conversation. Uh, additional, additionally, there are other bills, for example, one uh, deeply supported by the NAACP is an anti-racial profiling bill. Georgia is one of 22 states that, that doesn't uh, expressly outlaw racial discrimination in law enforcement. Uh, through racial profiling and of course this would exact criminal penalties uh, and, and civil liabilities uh, if uh, law enforcement engaged in racial profiling. This is necessary as we, we, we watch this nation engulfed in this conversation uh, around uh, Black Lives Matter, the use of police force and how we uh, hold police uh, accountable. Uh, an anti-racial profiling bill uh, is necessary in this day in time. There are other bills that are also important, uh, bills uh, that, uh, that give a fair share uh, to communities uh, in terms of education, so reformula of the way we divvy out education dollars. There are other bills that are particularly important to us, but we need your listeners to, to know how they can get involved. You can log on to our website, www.moralmondayga.org or NAACPGA.org. Find more information on how you can get involved. Uh, find out about this legislation, how you can lift your voice with us. Forward together and not one step back. We need you as a part of this effort. I'm going to ask a, another question. Uh, More Monday Georgia has been one of the things that Elle, the young sister who has uh, been such a key person here right. in Georgia in terms of elevating consciousness uh, mm -hmm. around this slogan of Black Lives Matter. At the end of her talk uh, this morning, while she recognized the value of uh, uh, legislation, right. she also talked about how, for many young people, that this is just seems to be a dead end uh, about pursuing, trying to get legislation passed, which then quite often, if it's if it's beneficial legislation, either gets chipped away very quickly, disregarded, or the rest. And who are more interested uh, in seeing, um, I guess I'd use the word direct action. They want to be loud. They want to be visible. They want their opposition shown in the streets. And uh, she talked about how there wasn't one or the other. Uh, that it's both. I would uh, like to hear your comment as well because More Monday in both in North Carolina and here has in fact uh, uh, been mostly active around the legislative session but the tactics they pursued are more comparable to what the sister was talking about. Right. So I was wondering if you would want to address that a little bit. Absolutely. So you know one thing that we want to be clear that 
in this in and trying to be progressive uh, in the, in a in a state that uh, is is quite conservative. We have no permanent friends or permanent enemies, just permanent issues, and our issues are are deal with how to move Georgia forward. And so, in a real sense, uh, we we understand that that is done through policy, uh, through the rule of law, uh, and we're trying to uh, create fairer policies and balance the rule of law uh, that would lead to a more progressive community. But at the same time, many of our so-called friends have been complicit uh, in the uh, declination uh, of uh, policies uh, that have benefited uh, the majority of Georgians. And we can't be quiet about that. And so people are upset. Uh, as a matter of fact, I deeply believe that Republicans uh, got their tutoring from the Democrats. The uh, gerrymandering that they did uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, the Republicans learned uh, how to do it and now they're doing super gerrymandering. Uh, and, and the same sorts of uh, divide and conquer politics that Democrats played, of course they, the Republicans simply played them to the extreme. So uh, we don't have any permanent friends or enemies. We just have permanent issues and we will lift our voice as it relates to the issues. Uh, this is not a Democrat or a, a, a Democratic movement versus a Republican movement. This is about issue, and the chief issue is putting people before politics. Um, I, Reverend Johnson, I had a, a question about um, mm -hmm. the rest of the state. And sure. your, from your perspective, um, I know that this, there's a saying that outside of Atlanta, there's a place called Georgia. Um, <laughs> I think C.T. Vivian is. Yes, on. yes. Um, can you describe how, uh, how it feels to you from where you live in the perspective of how these policies are affecting uh, Georgians statewide, not just in metro Atlanta? Absolutely. So I drove up today with Reverend Jane Page, who pastors in Statesboro and in Brunswick, Unitarian congregation there and uh, so from from one end of this state to the other we we have some experience with how Georgians are living. Uh, Governor Deal sits in a mansion paid for by the people's tax dollars uh, and, and goes to work every day uh, at a at a uh, capital uh, a golden, the golden, oh, no, a golden dome right but I want to let him know that there are real communities in Georgia that are affected by his policies to re his refusal to expand Medicaid when this was an idea that was first proposed by Republicans under the Reagan administration, block grants to the states to expand Medicaid. He supported it as a congressperson, but won't take the money as a governor because it's not a politically expedient. Well, I see those rural communities. Some of those people have to drive 50 miles or more to get to their nearest hospital. That has resulted in the loss of over 1,100 lives. This is not a political discussion. This is a moral crisis when there, there is help that can be received and he says no. Just as Governor stood in schoolhouses, do, schoolhouse doors during my parents' generation, Governor Deal stands in hospital doors and it has resulted in the death of Georgians and he has that blood on his hands. What about some of the other issues though? I mean, uh, it's uh, very interesting to me that um that as you mentioned, Georgia is number one and has been number one month after month. I think this past month we just uh, the state just dropped to number two, but um, month after month Georgia had the highest unemployment and Metro Atlanta as well. Uh, there's been some announcement about some of the major corporations, including this Mercedes company uh, headquarters that's going to move to Atlanta uh, relatively soon, and that is. Uh, uh, given such high pronouncement of the few hundred jobs that will result from this. And then mostly it's again a question of sort of status among the elite that, that Mercedes will be here. But for the tens and tens of thousands of people who earn minimum wage as the quote from Dr. King in laundries, in hospitals, uh, in restaurants, uh, all, the, all these uh, jobs that are necessary to society but uh, don't get any acclaim like a Mercedes sure. does. Um, where is it that you think that if uh, Georgia was actually pursuing a true jobs kind of piece of legislation, what would they do? Well, 
Jobs is is a result of or organized agenda uh, to to move society forward. That begins with a high quality free public education. But instead, Governor Deal presses a policy uh, that supports charter education, bankrupting public schools. Uh, the, the great social mobility that this country has experienced has been because we had uh, highly accessible, high quality public education. And that was pre-K through post-secondary options. Yet this government con con continues down a pathway of consolidating institutions, many of them access institutions. There's a new proposal on the table uh, that in the, in the guise of saving money would uh, consolidate Georgia Perimeter College, an access school, two-year access school for, for marginal students uh, with uh, Georgia State, uh, which is a research one institution. I can guarantee you that's going to result in less access for those marginal students. And that, at the end, is going to result in a less qualified workforce for Georgia. It continues with policies that promote the family. But instead of promoting a livable wage, it's, it's, it's an immoral for somebody to be able to work 40 hours a week, 52 weeks out of the year, and still be under the poverty line in Georgia. But that's the policies that this government uh, produces. And what that, what that means is, is that families have less time to spend with one another, have less quality of life, and are working two and three jobs just to get as far as they got uh, last year. And that's just, that's, that doesn't pr produce uh, the kind of workforce that we want. It continues through the kinds of opportunities that people experience within their community. If you go outside of Atlanta, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find the kinds of things to promote dynamic communities. Uh, there are many resources here in Atlanta, but outside the metro area, they're not there. You couple that with uh, a, a workforce uh, that uh, is seeing uh, their, their benefits uh, reduced and eliminated through corporate bankruptcies that are approved by this government and passed by the courts, uh, you see a complete uh, breaking of the promise of the public trust between uh, public employees who could count on uh, in exchange for uh, uh, a decent wage, uh, greater security and retirement. All of those promises have been canceled and broken. And, and yet Governor Deal wonders why we are uh, at the bottom of the heap when it comes to uh, jobs. It's the result of a uh, cascade of policies uh, that don't put people first, that put the corporations first. And a corporation's main job is to make profit for its shareholders. Our politicians should be working for quality of life for the citizens. Those things don't always uh, are not always the same, and most, most of the time they're not the same. So, Diane, I would say we, it's about a number of those issues all uh, producing the kind of climate uh, where Georgia simply uh, is not keeping up with the rest of the nation and is falling behind in the economic recovery uh, that uh, other parts of this, this country are experiencing. Uh, Reverend Johnson, I want to talk about the workers you just talked about mm -hmm. who are working two and three jobs um, and are still under the poverty line, mm -hmm. um, cannot survive without qualifying for things like EBT, mm -hmm. food stamps. Uh, at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we organize nannies, housekeepers, and home care workers uh, who are also low-wage workers sure. and predominantly women, women of color. Um, and in our second year here in Georgia, we... Uh, registered other women to vote. And we targeted uh, other domestic workers, uh, non-traditional voters. We went during the day to the parks, uh, to the areas, to the libraries, where they were at while they were working. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the voter fraud that happened uh, last year. I want to talk about the lawsuit with the Secretary of State uh, and the 50,000 missing votes. Where are we on that? Well. We're still looking, I'll tell you, those 50,000 votes uh, are unaccounted for. Governor Nathan Deal and Secretary Brian Kemp uh, have been silent about that, but we will continue to lift our, lift our voice. New Georgia Project, NAACP, of course, filed a lawsuit against Brian Kemp. It's not over. As a matter of fact, through our investigation, looking at the numbers, get this, Diane, this is important for your listeners to appreciate. Between uh, 2012 and 2014, Georgia experienced phenomenal growth in its population. But when you look at the Secretary of State's own numbers he produced, 
the, the voter registration rolls uh, have 300,000 less voters uh, in, in November 2014 than they did in November 2012. So not only, and that, that was when we added 135,000 new voters through progressive groups like New Georgia Project, NAACP, Legal Women Voters, and, other, and Galeo, and other groups who've been working to add new, new voters to the rolls. So not only was there a failure to register the folks that we turned in applications for, Governor Deal endorsed a plan through the Secretary of State's office to use cross-check as a multi-state uh, matching system that uh, eliminated another half million voters from the voter registration rolls within the last two weeks prior to the election. Now, he alleges that we committed fraud, and the proof he had for it was maybe two dozen applications that had some issue out of 135,000. That's an error record I put up against any of his departments, in including the DDS. And yet they steal 50,000 votes and purge a half a million votes weeks prior to the election, contrary to the National Voter Registration Act, mm -hmm. contrary to uh, the, uh, voter, uh, the uh, voter Rights Act, and call what we do fraud with no proof. Well, we're going to make them own that this year. We have the state litigation. We're also contemplating federal litigation on multiple points, and we will be heard on this. And I just want to add, just to be clear, every application, doesn't matter if somebody writes Mickey Mouse. They can write Jesus Christ. It is submitted. <laughs> the law requires us to submit it. But what we did, we flagged those and said, here is an application, and it says Jesus Christ. It says 1000 B.C. is the date of birth. This, we believe this is... There's, you know, something wrong with this application. We, we identified those 24, 25 applications. It wasn't as if they found it. Secretary of State went out and asked folks if they were having problems with voter registration. And if you notice the counties that responded, uh, we, that we discovered this in our litigation. These were count, there was one county who called the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State called everyone else. He went looking for a problem, as he did in Brooks County. And he alleged voter fraud against those courageous uh, Georgians who simply availed themselves of uh, the ballot and uh, registered folks and got them to vote through absentee ballots. He used the full weight of the state to prosecute those folks. Three trials, two mistrials, four years, millions of dollars wasted in that investigation. 400 citizens in Brooks County, that's a small county near the Florida line, interrogated by GBI. The governor removed three people from office and the people re-elected them the following year. And not a word, now that the prosecutor has dropped all of the charges against all of the remaining defendants after Lula Smart, through her uh, esteemed counsel, C.B. King and others, were vindicated in a trial in Brooks County where the judge dismissed half the counts against her and a jury of her peers acquitted her of the rest. Not a word. Not a word from this Secretary of State about his so-called voter fraud. There is no voter fraud. There's never been any voter fraud. It's a subterfuge for the suppressive tactics that this government has engaged in. Well, <laughs> and that's that. Uh, uh, I've uh, myself uh, have also gone down to Quitman Absolutely. in support of uh, the sisters and brothers there who, uh, as you said, availed themselves of a legal form of voting uh, that was normally used right. by uh, white voters, but right. when black voters used it, then it was all of a sudden a problem. Uh, I want to just raise one final question before we go, and that is kind of looking forward. Uh, um, what is What should, can we expect, what can the listeners expect uh, coming out of Moral Monday in the upcoming weeks? We did, uh, uh, Tamika did mention this demonstration um, rally on January 26th, and this is about a whole series of uh, pieces of legislation that Moral Monday is supporting in terms of uh, reform of police policing. Could you talk just a little bit more about some of those elements? Absolutely. This is the uh, protect and serve, not intimidate and abuse uh, effort on, on behalf of Moral Monday. You know, in the in the wake of Ferguson and the tragic death of Eric Gardner, who was choked to death 
in New York on video. at on mm -hmm. video. You know, you know, Diane, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, when Trayvon was killed, folks said, "Well, if we only had uh, some some witnesses, then neither no one was there, so we don't know really what happened." In Ferguson, there were nearly a dozen witnesses who all said that Mike Brown had his hands up. But folks said, well, I know we had witnesses, but if we only had it on video. In New York, we had it on video. And it's one excuse after the other. Now, the majority of folks in law enforcement are there to do their job. And they, do the, they, they want to do it in a way that honors their profession and want to make it back home to their families uh, at night. And I appreciate that. And I support law enforcement. But there is an element in law enforcement that believes they are an occupying force within many communities. And they abuse the privilege that we, ass we assign to them uh, when they take the oath uh, as a law enforcement officer. So Moral Monday is coming together to, to, with this wonderful energy uh, from activists who have become aware uh, of the reality of the day following Ferguson and Trayvon and Jordan Davis. And the names go on and on. There's a wonderful energy, uh, a spirit that, it, that, these, that young activists uh, have, uh, have brought to this work, and, and I love it. And, uh, and, and we hope to bring that together with a package of uh, law enforcement reforms that are pending in the legislature, introduced uh, by uh, some of our allies uh, who, are, who, are in the, who are serving in the General Assembly. So we hope to match that passion with change in policy. Coming together on, Ju on January 26th at the Georgia Capitol, at the Rotunda. If you want to, if you're angry, mad as hell about what you've seen and witnessed, what you've even experienced, I'm talking to your listeners, Diane, then you've got to do more than just be angry in your armchair at home. You've got to get out. And many of these debates and discussions happen during the day when I know you're making a living to feed your family. But this day calls for us to make great sacrifices. Get to the Capitol on January 26th at 3 p.m. as we lift our voices together uh, around this issue of police accountability. Most law enforcement officers I speak to don't want to be painted uh, by the actions of this element that I spoke about. They very much support body cameras. They very much support anti-racial profiling law. They very much support a repeal of this deadly stand your ground uh, law that is uh, that is superimposed uh, hyper sensibility hyper second amendment rights uh, where they're not needed traditional self-defense has guided jurisprudence since Cain and Abel uh, and a return to that is common sense so for those who want to do more than just be angry where you stand and sit join us on January 26 join with us in Moral Monday as we try to push up Georgia forward and, and a whole uh, a, a panoply of policies designed to address law enforcement here. Thank you so much. Uh, you just listened to uh, Reverend Francis Johnson, who is uh, one of the leaders of Moral Monday, Georgia. And we have come to the close, unbelievable, of another hour of uh, the labor forum here on WRFG. Christopher, were you able to get up Solidarity Forever? That is what we're going to close out then. We will be back again next Monday. Uh, please tune in. Please subscribe to the Labor Forum YouTube channel. Please watch us. Please like us on our Facebook page. And do everything you can to let your friends and neighbors know that there is a program here on WRFG that speaks to the concerns and interests of working people. Wow.